Hello, everybody. This is James Chai, RFR Park, Park Rescue Foundation, and I am back here, and I'm just going to turn down the thing. I hope everyone is doing really well. Today is uh, uh, Friday, and I have no idea what the date is today. It's Friday, December 5th, 2019, and I'm just going to just talk about just uh, what's been happening in my week and now, and I am just kind of, um, you can see I've got things set up now in a, in a bit. I picked up my, my swing arm and my microphone, and it's got a little shock thing here so it doesn't make it too loud and everything. So it's not going to be too much that I'm going to talk about today because I am just learning it all out. I'm figuring it all out. But hopefully you can hear me. The sound is better now. I found a graphic equalizer that I can uh, install into um, onto my laptop. I have my new laptop going on. Everything's going well, and then I'm going to start podcasting. I just did some improv stuff uh, last night or really early this morning just to see how it goes, and I'm going to start putting that up there and, and get a bit more nicer structure on things. You're going to start seeing some changes happening over the time um, in the next few weeks and months, and not just a new computer, a new environment. It's going to be a really nice area here for podcasting. You're going to see some really nice um, you know, just some nice, pleasant topics about things that have been causing a lot of people a lot of embarrassment and concern, which is about their dysfunctional dog. And a lot of people are having dogs that are causing issues for them that they don't know what to do and they're getting a bit frustrated by going to different trainers and behaviorists, reading stuff online. So I am going to uh, start formulating and, and um, creating a nice structure so that way I can talk about things with people and they're going to have them come in here and they're going to sit across from me and it's going to be kind of cool. So uh, a couple more weeks, we're going to get that going and then I will also be doing something really, really kind of cool that um, um, I think is really awesome and it's going to be with in collaboration with somebody else, a, a chef actually, um, a Red Seal chef and so we're going to do something together. And it's going to be really, really awesome, actually. So everybody I've talked to about it has went, wow, that's a great idea. And, um, well, we'll see. I haven't seen anybody do it yet. Maybe there will be, maybe not. So I don't know. I hope everyone is doing well. Happy Friday to you all. It's December. It's almost Christmas. And I'm sure everybody's out there shopping and everything. I'm so glad that I'm not out there um, in the mix. I like to kind of go out when it's uh, it's dead and during the daytime. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to end up um, doing a bunch of things that I'll, I'll end up talking about um, in my vlogs regards to dogs and the behaviors and the issues that they've had to deal with. Um, and Sammy is here. Little Sammy is here right beside me. And the cool thing is Sammy is getting a new wheelchair. Yeah. So Sammy's going to be pretty happy with that. And uh, her other wheelchair has been been pretty bad. It's uh, it, it's It's like two and a half years old and the wheels are running out of it. They're, they're wearing really thin and everything. And so um, Sammy hasn't been able to go out for the last couple of weeks, but it's really nice because I contacted uh, Sammy's original rescuer in Taiwan. And I said, I needed to get Sammy a replacement wheelchair and I'm happy to buy it, of course. Right. And believe it or not, they, uh, uh, Ping is a, uh, is a rescuer's name. She's quite well known in Taiwan. She said, oh, we're just going to donate it to Sammy for her Christmas present, which is absolutely amazing. And I saw pictures of uh, Sammy's new wheelchair. It is, it is pretty cool. Sammy's going to be really happy. It's way better than what she had beforehand. Uh, right. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to read off a, um, hi, Mary. I'm going to read off a, uh, a message that I received last, uh, uh, actually on Tuesday from uh, Sherry in regards to her dog. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it off and then we're just going to work through some things for Sherry. I don't know if she posted on my Facebook page or not. Um, and okay, so it's going to be kind of kind of a sad thing. So I'm going to read the thing. And I apologize I didn't put it in the descriptions. Nothing's in, in the descriptions today. So it's all pretty raw. I've just been trying to catch up with everything that I've been doing. And I'm trying not to sneeze. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. All right. Um, so th this message comes from Sherry. And she writes, and, and it's, a, it's a bit of a copy and paste because I know she was, uh, it, it seems like she's just kind of posting on other people uh, just to find out. And, and, you know, when you get to a point where you're having trouble with your dog and everyone's telling you to kill your dog, then it becomes pretty, pretty difficult. Okay. So um, she starts off and, and it's quite long. So she starts off and, and Sherry writes, 
Uh, let me just get to this point where Sherry's writing on things. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, and before I go on to that part, as I'm kind of breezing around here, uh, you're going to see some changes happening to my website as well. So it's going to be a bit more streamlined. Um, it's going to be a, a, it's it's going to be a bit more commercial in its appearance, um, but it is something that um, I'm getting help from a, a social media expert who um, uh, is out of uh, Washington D.C. and has got some pretty good connections there, and um, they've been helping me. Uh, he's been helping me with it, um, so we'll see how things go. Uh, I'm pretty excited. This is sort of. Uh, um, a slow step. For those of you who saw me the first time I broadcast my vlog, I was pretty nervous. And um, this is the next part of it. This is like jumping off the, the cliff. So anybody who has a dream out there, anybody who has wondered about what they should do in their life when they grow up, uh, this is definitely something to do is to follow something as simple as what I'm doing. And, um, you know, working with dogs, working with dangerous dogs is something that makes me very happy. And regardless of the danger and the risk getting attacked, it's something that makes me happy doing the vlog, doing the podcast that I'll end up doing. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool because it's going to allow me to really um, uh, structure what I'm doing because I'm so wildly organic, as you all know. It's going to allow me to structure what I'm doing and get to the point where I can um, share what I've learned over my 1,400 days, my over 20,000 hours of work alone with predatorial dogs and these significant giants. Uh, the nice thing about learning from such dangerous dogs is that I myself have learned a lot about myself, about the way I observe things, the way I see things, the way I process things, the way uh, uh, things are important or not important in life. And we've heard of the old uh, maxim, you know, first world problems. And that's true. Um, when it comes to uh, what I've learned about myself, it's a lot of insight, of course, a lot of introspection, uh, working with dogs who have been abused and severely abused and beaten until their, um, uh, you know, their their head trauma and stuff like that. Um, I learn a lot from these hurt souls, these victimized dogs, and any dog that exists in a shelter or a stray dog in a it, within a domestic area of uh, the population uh, is a victim of human apathy and antipathy. And it is something that has uh, been the reason why I started doing this vlog, the reason why I started getting my word out of what I'm doing. So uh, for those of you who are watching, this is uh, my next baby step, um, getting into this vlogging. And, and you know, you'll see, and, and, I, and I hope everybody's going to enjoy what's happening. Um, if you have any topics, feel free to message me or comment it uh, below, and then I'll um, add to that. Okay, so Sherry writes, sorry for the long message, but someone recommended you on Facebook, and I'm sorry to bother you, but need someone to help us keep helping this boy. Now, um, and I'm going to interrupt all these things here. The reason why she says that, uh, Sherry says that, is a lot of times when people contact a trainer or behaviorist, uh, they will be told that we, we, don't, we don't help you online. We can't help you. We're not going to, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because they don't know what they're doing, so they don't know how to help remotely. Um, on top of that, as well, I do understand that people are, um, uh, professionals are always cautious about other people soliciting them for free advice, free training, not just a legal aspect if there's something does happen, but also for the fact that they're just asking for a free advice. Um, mine is a bit different because as you know, I have a, my website, right? Like I'm saying, I'm revamping it. Uh, it's just going to get streamlined a bit more. It's arfarfbarkbark.com. And if you go to the tab, uh, help for your dogs, you're going to see that I have helped a number of people for free online, um, through my web, uh, sorry, through my Facebook page, which is my reactive skittish dangerous dog group. You can join that as well. And you can pose your question into it and post clear photos of your dog's eyes, face, and body. And then it allows me to have that opportunity to go over everything and what your problem that you may feel, you're the only one that has this problem with your dog, turn, will always turn out to be that there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds and thousands of people that have dogs that are similarly having issues. There are almost 100 million dogs in North America alone. So the chances of you having a dog that's dysfunctional with another person somewhere across the country, somewhere next door to you, having the similar type of problem with their dog, regardless if it's the same breed or not, it's very, very likely. And a lot of the things that I run into people 
are dogs with similar behavioral issues when you look at it at the surface, but when you get down deeper below that surface and the, the rooted psychogenetic behavior of the dog, that psychosis, that base root, that's when we start figuring out the, the, the layers of your dog's particular personality. And it is ridiculous for anyone to ever think that dogs are dumb and that dogs are essentially just, you know, cutouts of each other and with the same type of personality and et cetera. Anybody who has had more than one dog knows each dog has their own quirks and personality, just like humans, just like children. And um, so when you do post a question, it allows me to help other people and it allows you to help other people as well. So uh, Sherry goes on to say, all right, uh, update. And then her dog's name is Floki, F-L-O-K-I, Floki or Flocky, Fluky, Fluker, Floki. And Floki is 21 months old, very tall for his age. I am going to assume that Floki is a Great Dane because there's no photos, there's no pictures, nothing at all. And uh, this, is a, this was a cold uh, message to me in the sense that it was just sent to me unsolicited. Okay, so update. Floki is 21 months old, very tall for his age. We rescued him from a family that said he bit a home care nurse and couldn't keep him in the home because of it. All right, so the family said bit, an, bit an, uh, a home care nurse. So that right off the bat says to me that there's already been issues that are present or pre-existing for something to happen. Okay, so keep that in your head, uh, everyone. Um, then she goes on, I phoned the breeder to just tell them what was happening and if they had issues with their own, excuse me, with their own dogs or their own puppies, et cetera. Excuse me, I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, uh, if they've had any issues with their own dogs. Uh, she goes on, I don't know about contracts, et cetera, but apparently the people who gave us Floki were supposed to return him to the breeders. And that happens quite often, right? Because people are embarrassed that they're, they've failed their dog, that they've caused the dog to become dangerous or aggressive predatorial or skittish or some sort of behavior issues that the dog is no longer a regular normal dog and so a lot of times people are embarrassed and they won't return the dog back to the breeder they will instead shirk off that dog to somebody else not because they're just not just trying to move away the problem from themselves but they're so embarrassed that they don't want to tell the breeder that they failed one of their own the breeder's dogs so that can be quite frustrating for the breeder themselves because it's you know, they love their puppies and they want them to go to good homes. And if it's not a backyard breeder, a legitimate breeder will make sure that they get a chance to see what your home looks like. They're going to ask for pictures. They're going to do an interview with you on the phone, if not in person. They're going to want to do a home visit. This is a breeder, not, a, not an adoption agency, but a, an actual legitimate breeder, not a backyard breeder that's going to meet you somewhere at a parking lot and you'll be like, oh, well, you know, the guy said he was too busy to meet. Uh, but he's going to meet me at Safeway. No, no. Those are backyard breeders. Those are puppy flippers. Those are people making money off of dogs. And in one way, it's, yes, they're getting life for this dog, but in the same way that they are not checking out the the, the homes, they're not checking out the, the health of the dog. A lot of things can happen, and it's really quite unfortunate because money seems to be the motivation. And um, ironically, the government doesn't want to do anything about it. And I've contacted the ministry of agriculture uh, here in British Columbia to, to see what they're going to do about it. And they're saying, well, we're not. Do we have our key stakeholders looking to it, like the BC SPCA and all that, which the SPCA has been involved with this for several years and they've gotten nowhere. But hey, they have no problem telling us that they helped bring up uh, petition signatories for, uh, you know, laws to, to outlaw bestiality, et cetera, which I already thought was outlawed in pretty well every province and state. and that's the SPCA. They're focusing on something that is so 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 um, um, uh, isolated in occurrences versus the actual fact where backyard breeders are literally contributing millions of dogs into the system. Backyard breeders are doing that, millions. It's a huge industry. If you think of each dog that each backyard breeder sells for, say, $500, and you're talking about, because there's 100 million dogs in North America, where are they coming from? Mostly from backyard breeders. A lot of legitimate breeders, a lot of legitimate certified registered breeders. But say even 10 million dogs are coming in from backyard breeders at $500 a pop. That is a $5 billion black market industry that you, if you're buying a backyard bred dog, are contributing to. So always try to make sure that you contact a legitimate breeder and um, that's all I'm saying because uh, 
six million dogs are being killed annually. So it's it's pretty rough. All right, back onto this thing again. Um, so so she, Sherry goes on to say, I don't know about contracts, et cetera, but apparently the people who gave us Floki were supposed to return him to the breeders. We don't have a contract with anyone. We rescued him. We are not putting the dog down because the responses you have provided lean towards resource guarding of toys and his bed. So I'm, I'm assuming that she's talking about me, but I'm not sure um, because uh, it's a bit of a, it's a cold uh, message to me. Uh, I, you know, I mean, like it's cold out of the blue. Uh, okay, so that's it. All other times, he's a normal weem. Okay, so he's a uh, okay, so he's not a great Dane. So he's all right. Um, gets along with our other dogs. The breeder told us to give him back to them, or they would sue. Uh, you know, if it's a legitimate breeder, then that's the case. Then um, you know, then that legitimate breeder does have a, a, a legal point to stand on. They ultimately can, because then it would just be theft of property. Okay, I hate to say that about a dog because dogs aren't property, but that would be the case. So that breeder would still have legal um, um, relevance uh, to that. Okay, so the breeder said that uh, would sue. Um, so I could never return him to them, and we love the dog. Uh, please understand, we know we aren't perfect parents, but we are sure giving it all we got. So that's good. So then, you know, there's a lot of strong emotions in there, a lot of great feeling in there that they very much care for this dog that somebody dumped on them and that they've taken responsibility and they've taken more responsibility. So it sounds like because of that uh, Floki has bit a caregiver or care worker at the previous home. So now we're going to come up and as we start to figure out what's going on as I destructure the comments here that she's sent me here. We are in need of advice on resource guarding and have already taken measures when he has uh, something. Uh, we distract him with something else and it works fine. He listens to commands, does well with sit and stay there until released. We have a seven-year-old Weimer, oh, okay, as well, and they are getting along, but I don't leave toys up because if Floki plays with them, then Zuzu, which is the seven-year-old, uh, wants it. And what's actually happening is Zuzu wants to engage, but Floki doesn't know how to play. So I haven't read further than this, but you all know what's going to end up happening is we're going to read about, I'm going to read out there that obviously Floki is getting to fights with Zuzu when Zuzu tries to take the toy. So we'll read on here, right? So uh, my questions, uh, 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 my questions, resource guarding tips, please. Okay. So I would think that, so my questions are about resource guarding tips, please, I guess. Do you let two dogs play with toys in the same room because we cannot? Okay, so when it comes with me, when I have dogs uh, and they're resource guarding, and they're not just resource guarding with toys and they're resource guarding with food and I feed raw. So when my dogs are here, they're significant. And they're not just like, oh, hey, you know, I play around and just kind of walk away. They don't walk away from each other. They attack each other. And in the beginning, it's always, always very brutal, very, very difficult to deal with Great Danes. And, you know, Minky's a, 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 like it's just a small little 50-pound dog. So he's pretty tiny. And he'll get into fights as well with resource guarding with them, with the other dogs. If they come too close, um, a lot of things will happen. Uh, they will always, in the beginning, because that's the nature of the dogs that I get here, they will always attack each other. They will always attack me as well when it comes to food. So it's a normal thing in my life that every single dog that I work with, I have to be prepared and I am prepared to get bitten. And it hurts like freaking crazy because when you get bitten by a small dog like, uh, like Minky, it's whatever, right? It's a little bit of a bite. When you get bitten by a, a Great Dane, uh, it's a lot of an impact uh, uh, bite. So uh, I say by an impact bite is not only are they biting into me with huge teeth, but they're biting into me with force behind their jaws upwards of 700 PSI. So then not only do I get lacerated and, you know, my skin gets cut open and everything like that, but also the bruising takes upwards of two to three weeks to surface. And it hurts like crazy the whole time. Um, I don't know. Oh, I have one that's here faded. Let me just see if I can show you all. Uh, uh, yeah, you can see my arm and all that stuff. One of them is here. Okay. So, oh, which one was it? Anyhow, uh, there, it's it's pretty well faded, but you can't see anyhow. But um, I'm trying to figure out how to do this angle here. Um, this was actually, this one here, these two little dots here were actually a larger four-sided, uh, four-point dot. 
And that was actually from Walter one time when um, um, he got upset with me and he, he grabbed me um, at my old place uh, by the arm. And it's just one tooth. That was just his one tooth that got me and it caused a uh, uh, four, four point bite um, just from one tooth. And it hurt like crazy for a while as well. So it's not just a small little bite. These are, these are, these are big bites, right? And you know, we have the, the cuts and like, I think I have one here too as well, right? Yeah. So a bit of a scar here. You can't really see. It actually comes into a smiley face. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's great memories, great memories. So um, uh, let me get back to here because I got distracted. Um, so when, when it does come to the dogs, when they are fighting over food and resources, for me, it's normal. And because it is normal for me, to see any dog, new dog, even a dog that's been here for a while to get into a resource guarding situation over food and attack me or attack somebody else or attack, well, not somebody, I mean another dog here. It is just normal. And because I know that it's going to happen, that there will be an attack, I have to be vigilant. And that's the same thing when it comes to you all who have dogs that are resource guarding for food, for toys, for anything. If you know your dog's going to attack, and even if it's one attack out of a hundred times, that one time is all you need to have an issue, right? So that means you can't just sit there and go, oh, well, he's not always gonna, my dog's not always going to react, so I'm not that concerned about it. You have to pretend that it's going to happen. And if you're pretending that it's going to happen. And if you're watching, knowing that it's going to happen, means you'll be watching for the signs before it happens that you'll pick it up beforehand. Because there's so many people that go out there and say to me, I don't know what happened. It just happened. It's suddenly unpredictable. We don't know why, what happened, and all that stuff. And then when I destructure the conversation and when I destructure the environment of what happened, the incident that occurred, then I have a better idea of what happens. And I'm able to explain to the, the, the owners this is why it happened. And when you talk about this and this, for example, you know, if you drop something on the floor and your dog goes to get it, you go for it to pick it up because it's our natural instinct to pick up the food that we dropped and our dog thinks we're getting at it and he has a competitive nature is what it happens is why they go for it and they go to attack us. If I know that and I have dogs that were like that before, they don't do that now because they trust me. But if I do drop food in the beginning with a dog that I know will attack or may attack me, I leave it on the ground. I don't try to pick it up. I don't make it a big deal. I just let them take it. They take it. If it's small piece, big piece, whatever it is, if it's not poisonous, right? If it's not, and, and I don't buy grapes, I don't buy onions, I don't buy garlic because those are poisonous to dogs and other fruits and vegetables to check it out on. But if I drop something that's not poisonous, I'm going to resist the urge immediately to reach down for it because it's going to cause that dog to attack me and I'm just going to let them go and take it away and I'm not going to make it a big deal. And it's kind of like if you think about those construction workers that work up on the high rise, on the girders, on the steel girders and the beams 30, 40, 50, 100 stories up. If they drop their hammer right? I mean, they probably don't use hammers, but if they drop their hammer. They don't reach down and go for it because it, it, they would fall off and die. So it's that same kind of urge to resist reaching for that. And so if you're ready and you're prepared and you go in your head, you think, okay, I'm cutting this meat up. And if I accidentally drop it because my dog is beside me and is a resource guarding dog. And if I drop it, I have to remember that if it does drop on the floor, I am not going to go for it. I'm going to resist the urge and keep my hands up on the counter and then it falls on the floor. And then your dog won't think of it as a controversial moment either. So I'll get into more of these explanations once I do the podcast so that it's more structured, like I said. Um, but uh, just again, if you drop something, there's resource guarding, just leave it. I mean, I've had it where I've handed a plate uh, like I've said this before, where I, I have a plate that I finish my meal on and then I go to let one of my dogs look at it and Walter will literally lick at it and in the beginning, he'll lick the plate and even after a second or third lick of the plate, he'll immediately go and attack me and he'll bite my hand and uh, it hurts like crazy and I drop the plate and I'm like, holy cow and then I have to stand there and fake it and pretend that I'm not scared and I have to pretend that it's just, okay, well, it happened. Because if I make a big deal of it, it's going to create a heightened sense with, with Walter, with any dog. It's going to create a heightened sense with them 
because of my reaction. And fear is the most difficult thing for any human being to suppress. So you got to fake it. You're aware of what's going to happen. If it does happen, you already have a plan in place of what to do. Just like a boxer learns left, left, left jab and all that, right? They learn and they have contingencies and they, they practice the same routines again, duck and, duck and jab. They practice and practice the same routine over and over and over and over again so it becomes instinctive. That's what you have to do when it comes to observing your dog and thinking to yourself, if something happens, this is what I'm going to do. Then you're prepared. Same thing like I talk about the psychology of buying the proper leash and why and how the benefits of holding the leash properly so that you're not consciously thinking about holding it and anchoring it, it removes you from having that stress of, oh my gosh, I'm going to let go of the, the leash by accident. So um, so there's that. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to go back. So she goes, uh, do you let two dogs play with toys in the same room? Because we cannot. I think if we gave Zuzu a chew bone, and Zuzu's the older dog, right? The older one, I'm seven years old. Um, uh, we could play fetch and release with a toy in another room, and she wouldn't be so jealous. Thanks to each and every one of you who offered a, opinion and advice. So that that's why you know it's a copy and paste here. Um, but I understand that she has issues here. Um, okay, you can message me too if you want. Uh, right now he's barking at wild turkeys in the yard. We haven't been able to let him off lead yet. That's another training issue as well. Blessings and thanks. Um, and then she goes on, never before have we had a dog so traumatized to be in a new home. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, the, 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 the stuff you're talking about, Floki, it's child's play. And, and I'm not trying to devalue or denigrate what your, what your concerns are. Like I say, it's to each owner, each person, their dog's behavior, dysfunctional or not, is 100% urgent to you. It's, a, it's, it's super urgent, important heartbreaking, stressful, anxious type of thing. And I know that my, because my dogs aren't just regular kind of, oh, hey, you know what? My dog's reactive. So what? My dogs are 150 pounds and up and they're big and they're huge. And when people see me with them and they start barking, it completely freaks the heck out of them. And they pick up their dog, like, you know, like a golden retriever and they'll, and they'll, and they'll pull them out of the way so that they don't come by on, on my end. So I completely know uh, what it's like to have traumatized dogs and, and, and um, the guys I deal with, they're, they're brutal. They're brutal. Uh, okay, so never before I had uh, traumatized a new home. We did some things wrong in the beginning, not keeping him in a crate. So keeping him in the crate is a difficult thing to say because you don't know what the background is um, on, on Floki. So you don't know if Zuzu, uh, Floki was crated or how he was crated and how he behaved. Most times when people surrender a dog, they don't tell you the full truth. And then the rescue or the shelter gets a dog that they have to figure out on their own because, again, uh, when someone surrenders a dog, they're just going to tell you all the good things with some of the bad things because they don't want you to kill their dog but then they're giving up their dog, right? So, you know, they dump their dog and they're like, oh, well, we're not going to tell them everything because if we tell the shelter everything, they're just not going to take our dog. And end of the day, that dog will end up getting killed if you're not fully disclosing things. Okay. Um, all right. So um, we did some, some things wrong in the beginning, not keeping them in a crate, spending time with us, etc. Okay. So that's cool that you understand that. The first day he bit me, my husband and our dog, we attributed that to fear biting. So he bit her, he bit her husband, and he bit uh, Zuzu, her other dog. Okay. So then that means that they were overwhelming him. Uh, you guys were overwhelming Floki and trying to get Floki to feel uh, inclusive. And that pushed him a little bit too far. So it's okay. It actually is not okay. It's great to spend time and it's great to connect with your new dog, especially if you know that they have an issue with their history. It's really good because it allows the new dog to get used to you in your more raw, natural format versus just pretending and say, hey, you know what, you're good and I'm going to be here for you and, and all that stuff. You, you don't want to be disingenuous. Okay. Um, so, okay, so he bit uh, me, my husband, and our dog. We attributed that to fear biting. Since we have each been bitten uh, – since we have each been bit, uh, me me overcoming near his bed. Okay. Since we have each been bit, 
me overcoming near his bed and my husband over taking up a shredded toy. Oh, okay. Since we, okay, so she, you were bit for coming near his bed and your husband was bitten for taking up a shredded toy from him. So we sought training and she said he could be worked with. Okay, so the trainer told her he could be worked with. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple issue there. Sunday, the trainer came here. We talked an hour and a half before she asked to see Floki. So you paid that trainer, uh, whatever, you know, an hour and a half to just stand there and talk to you about their dog. And the reason why a trainer, a behaviorist, Dr. Rebecca Ledger, uh, you know, Karen Pryor, Claudia Richter, Ian Dunbar, why they stand there and they talk to you about your dangerous reactive dog is because they know they're going to get bit. So the less time they spend with you talking, by talking and talking means the less time. I mean, the more time they spend talking with you is less time that they have to deal with your dog. And if they know what to do with your dog. They're going to say, let's see your dog. I get, to, I get to a session, I don't want to talk to you about your dog. And I tell people, I'm not going to make eye contact with you. I'm going to concentrate on your dog, and we're going to talk, but we're going to work with your dog right here in front. And it doesn't matter if your dog is muzzled or not, if your dog is going to attack me or not, going to be on leash, going to make sure that's happening. I'm going to concentrate immediately on your dog. I'm not going to spend half an hour standing there talking to you. I'm not even going to spend 10 minutes or even five minutes talking to you. I'm going to get right to work because you're not just paying me to work with your dog, but you're expecting me to work with your dog. An hour and a half of standing there talking, that's reprehensible. And it reflects the inexperience of that trainer. It's, it's unbelievable. Standing there for an hour, an hour and a half to talk, and you're paying them for an hour and a half to talk. You want to hear somebody talk for an hour and a half? Watch my vlogs. That's an hour and a half right there. Time wasted. Either it's good or not. doesn't matter. But at least you don't have to pay me to, to listen to me talk to you for an hour and a half about dogs. So we talked an hour and a half before she asked to see Floki. And, you know, it just it, it's so hokey, man. Look at the dog right away. Work with the dog. If you don't know what to do, then end it. But it's prolonging it. It's hiding my vegetables so I can eat my dessert. But then I still have my vegetables. Oh, wait a minute. We're just going to throw them underneath the table, which is the issue. The dysfunctional dog is the vegetables. Let's get rid of the dog's behavior so we don't have to deal with a dog. I don't know what to do. So I'm going to get, I'm going to talk to you for an hour and a half. My gosh. It doesn't matter if, the, if they charge you $400 an hour or 60 bucks an hour. You're still just, that's not cool, man. That's just really not cool. So we talked for an hour and a half and she, before she asked to see Floki, my husband brought him out on a pressure collar, so not an e-collar. I'm not sure what a pressure collar is. I, I think it is one of those collars that have those uh, plastic uh, nubs or spikes on it, like plastic spikes. Uh, because, okay, so brought him out on a pressure collar because I can't walk him otherwise. So he's a Weimer, which, I mean, he's like 40, 50 pounds, right? Okay. So the reason why you can't walk him on a leash uh, is because you're not confident of how to work with him on a leash. You haven't established a relationship, which I call being a leash ninja with your dog. You're not being vigilant working with your dogs, your dog on leash, right? So, so you want to check out my vlog, The Psychology of Buying the Proper Leash, and then you'll get a better idea. Uh, we walked him. Okay, so, uh, so you can't walk him. We walked him. Uh, okay, sorry, it's all over the place here. Uh, we walked him, took him outside, etc. Okay, then she asked to take the lead and to get out a toy. Floki dropped the toy when asked, picked up, dropped until she put her foot on his ball. He put his foot on the ball. Within a split second, he lunged at her twice with not a growl, broke her skin on her forehead and lip. She had not, and had she not glasses on, she would have lost an eye. <laughs> amateur oh my gosh and i don't mean to be mocking her uh this trainer is the most dumbest thing in the world i like it, what is she 12 uh, sorry um wow that's like so dumb she didn't even create a, a level of trust she didn't create a connection with with floki she did no establishment at all she talked for an hour and a half so that way floki would hear her voice so that floki wouldn't be so reactive to her uh, she all these little subconscious hidden phony behaviors that this trainer did all done because she was afraid and she was scared. And then she didn't know what to do. And she literally started off on the wrong foot. So she actually, when he dropped the toy, she put her foot on the ball 
And then she went to go get at, like, he put his foot on the ball. Within a split second, he lunged at her twice with not a growl and all that stuff and broke the skin on her forehead and her lip. So that means she was down to his level. So if a dog is reactive, the last thing I'm going to do if I'm not sure that the human has control of their dog on leash, and if their dog especially is free-ranged, that's reactive or possessive or guarding or consequential, whatever, I am not going to put myself into a dangerous position where the dog can get at me, get to my face. I've learned. And this shows why this particular trainer is way in over her head. And if she had lost an eye, it would have been her own fault. And... Um, to be honest with you, I don't have, uh, and I know this sounds a bit mean, and, I, and I'm thinking it through as I'm about to say it, but it's, she deserved that. And the reason why she deserved it is because she, she wasted an hour and a half just blabbering, trying to calm herself down, trying to get Floki used to her voice, which means she knew she was weighing over her head. And she thought she would do her basic little tricks, which they all do, you know, all these, all these people um, who say they work with aggressive dogs. They use your little parlor tricks, and that parlor trick uh, ended up getting her bitten in the face. You know, for me, when I, when I work with any of my dangerous dogs, I am very conscious of it. And, and they're not just where they just bite my face a little bit. They, they, they engulf my head like Nero did one time. And he grabbed me by the top of the head and, and both temples at the same time. So... I'm very aware of it because I work with these dangerous dogs on a regular basis. And for her to do that, because she's going to be the first person that's going to be out there saying, oh, um, I don't know what to do, but there's a big problem with your dog and you might want to kill your dog. So that's what ends up happening often. Inexperience, ego, unfamiliarity with danger. And then the dog will end up paying the penalty because of the human uh, ignorance. Okay, so she would have lost an eye, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my husband saw Floki's movements change. Okay, so her husband was watching. Now the breeder is saying she will not train him. She was going to put him on a table and shock collar him. Oh, my God. Okay, that breed is a piece of garbage. That's legal standing or not on this contract, that, that, that breeder is a piece of garbage. You don't need a shock collar. You don't need a shock collar. I've never used a shock collar is like such an amateur uh, device, brute force device used by any professional. You know, I can understand, and I've said this before, I can understand if somebody has to use a shock collar themselves, right? It's not my bag. And if you need to use a shock collar, you don't need to hire me because I just don't work with people like that. But, um, if you don't want to use a shock collar anymore, anymore, then you can hire me and I'll work with you. You know, but I won't work with people who who, who can't get past that because of their own nervousness or uh, anxieties or insecurities. Because that will end up making your dog worse. And on top of it, you'll try what I teach you, and then you'll be too weak, and you go back towards using a prong or a shock collar. Um, and and it's because it's an easy fix. We all want easy for some odd reason. Nobody ever wants to do the hard work and go for the long haul when it comes to working with dogs. That's why, again, that trainer spent an hour and a half talking to you and wasted your money. Okay. Uh, all right. um, and that after, okay, what, she was, she was going to put him on a table and shock him. And that after the 10-day quarantine, he should be put to sleep. I, I don't know what is being written here, Sherry. I'm now the breeder is saying she will not train. She was going to put him on a table and shock him, and that after the 10-day quarantine, he should be put to sleep. So I'm assuming that after the quarantine period occurred after he bit the care aid worker at the previous home, then he was put into a 10-day quarantine to make sure he doesn't have rabies because otherwise they have to cut the dog's head off to figure out if they have rabies. Um, he should be put to sleep, uh, which is a, a dumb that's just dumb. It's not put to sleep, killed. Stop using sleep, put to sleep. Stop saying uh, euthanize, which is even a, the most disgusting scapegoat answer that any professional can ever use. Euthanize. 
behavioral euthanasia, total weak scapegoat thing that blames the dog for the ineptitude and inexperience of the trainer. Uh, I think Dr. Ledger uses that, Dr. Pryor, Dr. Claudia Richter, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Uh, all of these people are at the top of the food chain using weak behavioral euthanasia. It, it's such a disservice. All right. I mean, I've got dogs that are all beyond the behavioral euthanasia scale. I've got dogs that have attacked over a dozen people, inflicted significant wounds. I've never ever considered euthanasia because it's a stupid word. I'm, you know, when, uh, you know, yesterday I posted up on my Facebook about my beloved Nero Chai, who, who would have been 14 years of age yesterday. And he had dragged a woman off the couch, uh, to, uh, a very large woman off the couch in his foster's place in Alabama and caused wounds that required 67 stitches. Hated men, right? And would would jump at men who wanted to, to adopt him, and he'd jump at them over the fence, trying and grabbing onto their jackets, trying to drag them over into his, his um, into the yard of the Fosters. He came here. He tried to attack. Nero came. <laughs> Nero tried attacking me a number of times here, and he did attack me a few times, but not once did I ever think to myself, behavioral euthanasia. Not once did I think, well, this dog can't be fixed, and I should kill this dog. I should kill. No not once. I get frustrated, I get scared, I'm frightened, I am shaking, I'm so scared, and then I just get back and do what I'm supposed to do, which is help save his life. And um, these people here who talk about behavioral euthanasia and putting the dog to sleep, no. You know, when Nero died on June 11th, I killed him. That's, I was, I had a hand in, that's me. I killed Nero. I had a to do so was it euthanasia yeah i mean because of his age and he couldn't walk anymore but when it comes to a dog that's perfectly healthy running around on all fours and they're just reactive aggressive whatever simple little things to deal with dangerous whatever it's just straightforward things for me to deal with it's not euthanasia it's not behavioral euthanasia it's an easy way out for the professional because they know they don't know what they're doing. And they're like, well, we're going to blame your dog because I don't want my reputation affected. And I've said this before. Is if I go into your home and you've read up on me, you've read my newspaper, oh, not mine, but you've read the newspaper articles on the front page and the, seen the television segments on me and all that stuff. And I say to you, yes. And I say this to everybody. I'm the only person in North America, if not the world, that works with predatorial giant dogs, 150 plus pounds. I don't just say it. I've proven it. Newspapers. People, rescue organizations all know that. Minky the Jindo from South, uh, from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, they've rescued over 20,000 dogs. They reached out to me in North America. They didn't reach out to Ian Dunbar. They didn't reach out to Claudia Richter. They didn't reach out to anybody, uh, any of these other names that I've heard these names out. They didn't reach out to Learberg. They reached out to me. And then within 36 hours, I did the impossible, which none of these people could ever do. So when I come into your home, you hire me, and I'm telling you that I've done this with Minky, that I've done this with dangerous giant dogs, and I meet your dog, Floki, for example. If I come in and meet Floki, who's, who's probably like 40, 50 pounds, a little, right, little dog. If I said to you, yeah, you know what, Floki's too much. There's, uh, he's too dangerous. I've never come across a dog this dangerous before. You're going to say two things. One, wow, my dog... Floki is really bad and can't be helped. And two, oh my gosh, I thought James was the best trainer in the world. I thought he worked with dangerous dogs, and this is just a 50-pound dog. So he must, he, he must not actually be able to help any dog. He's just lying. I stand behind what I do. I've never turned down a dog, and I've openly challenged and openly said I will accept any dog. I've had people troll me. I will take your dog, bring your dog here, and I will work with your dog. And after I work with your dog, I'm going to let you work with one of my dogs that I'm working with. We'll see how, we'll, we'll see how soon these people live. Because my dogs don't, when they first come here, when I take them in, they're not just dogs that bite people. They're dogs that go out to kill people. That's the hard work. That's where the 24-7 work comes in. That's where you spend all your time with your dog in the beginning, just like Minky, like Walter, like Nero, 
like Lincoln, like Zevia, every single dog, all that time is worked with all the time. Does not matter. It's got to be done. Who cares if the dog's going to try to attack me? So what? I'll heal. I had the breeder info. Okay, I had the breeder's info from the people that gave him to us and called to ask and tell her his demeanor. She said she would call me that evening. She wanted to come and pick up the dog, Floki, right? She said some people don't know how to handle them. So the breeder was trying to blame uh, uh, Sherry, this, the, the mom here. Um, we have had German Shepherd pointers, another weem, uh, and I disagree with her. That's what she said. I have since left messages for a trainer in New York. I'd love to know who that trainer is in New York. Um, I got hired by somebody in Florida. Um, uh, they, they, uh, this person has uh, is a is a CEO of a multinational, and he's got. They live uh, in Florida. They live in um, uh, Manhattan as well, so they're quite well off, and. Um, they had hired the best trainer in New York, and she charges a lot of money, and she's got a number one best-selling book that came out years ago. Um, and she actually flew her down to Florida to work with her four dogs and couldn't get any movement ahead, and they ended up having to muzzle the dogs, double gates so that the dogs can jump over the gate and attack each other, all these kinds of things. It took me one session over the phone. To address it all. So I'd love to find out who that trainer in New York is. Okay, so her, Sherry goes on, how we would get them there, I don't know, because of our back issues. Okay, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so I guess you have a bad back. Uh, so go ahead and smack me around for doing something wrong. Okay, so that's, like I said, that's why I suspect that she posted this on, on the different groups and all that. Um, but I don't want to get rid of them. I don't want to see this trainer take him thinking nothing bad happened, but my husband is fearful of our safety as every bite has been by our eyes. So here are my questions. Number one, what would you do? Give him to the breeder? Well, right off the bat, I, it's a hard question for me to answer because I don't take dogs that are just whatever from other people. I, I actively look for dangerous dogs. So, um, I just take them, right? I, I don't care what the background is on it. They're dangerous. If they attacked at least six people, then yeah, come on in. And they have to, preferably they're 150 pounds or more. So, um, you know, I, uh, if, if you're happy with Floki, I would keep him. The, the guaranteed, well, I wouldn't say it's guaranteed, but it's quite evident that the breeder will end up killing Floki anyways. For a couple of reasons. One is because she's frustrated and pissed off at you and, and the previous owner. And also because she can't afford to allow a dog under her lineage, under her breed, to have that kind of a reputation. Because then it's like, oh, your dog, you, you have a litter with dogs that are reactive, dangerous, right? It's no, I mean, I would say 40% of the dogs out there in the world have some sort of dysfunctions. Six million dogs are being killed. And those are the extreme decisions to do. That's 6%, 100 million dogs. How many people do you know of, you see, who have dogs like, yeah, my dog's a little, a little bit of a jerk sometimes, blah, 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 right? So, um, so yeah, I would keep, uh, I, I wouldn't return Floki to the breeder because he will very much face a death. Uh, number two, she asked, should I try to find a trainer near us is what she asked. And, of course, you should. Unfortunately, I don't know where, uh, where you are, so I'm unable to help you, Sherry, there. Um, and then she goes, we have, not we have not introduced him to people much yet either, which is something that you want to do. Even if you're not introducing him outwardly or overtly to other people, you want to at least take him out there so he's socialized and he gets, Floki gets to see other people and look around. Hey, how's it going? Look, I'm in the whole world. And if you leave him in the home, it's going to make it difficult for him. Unless you know what you're doing, it's going to make it very difficult because then he's just going to be secluded to his own little area, right, which is the home. And he won't learn and be excuse me, um, acclimated to the environment of your neighborhood. Um, so she goes, uh, he sleeps in a crate at night and is perfect. Toys or bones, both dogs are separated. My husband's fear is someone getting bit. My fear is we give him to a breeder we don't know and someone else gets hurt. Like I said, uh, he, yeah, that breeder will, will very likely kill Floki. So... That's not an if, and, or but. 
the other thing is um, uh, finding a trainer near you. Obviously, that would be best because I don't know. Again, in New York sounds like you're far away from from there. Uh, he's, okay, so um, my husband's fear. Okay, my fear is we give him to the breeder and we don't know, and someone else gets hurt. I was taught never to give away a problem dog, but I don't believe he can't be helped, which I agree. Every single dog, no matter how dangerous, no matter how predatorial, doesn't matter if they've attacked or killed someone, which generally those dogs are killed right away anyways, but killed another animal, whatever it is, or it has the potential to kill someone. These are normal dogs. Um, okay. But I okay. I welcome questions, ideas, thoughts. Please be gentle. I've been crying since Sunday over this, and she sent this to me on Tuesday. Uh, I ask for your loving, concerned questions and suggestions as to what you do would do. Thanks for listening. So that's what she wrote down to some, her post. Uh, stress, and she says stressed at the end of it. And I just responded back to her. Says I need to see some photos of um, of Flo and all stuff. She replies. Thank you for taking the time to respond to me. We have made a lot of calls and spoke with several trainers, but all have different opinions or use shock therapy. Like I said, shock therapy, shock collars, uh, e-collars, choke collars, it's really the weak, it's the weak professional using, it's the inexperienced professional using a brute force device. It's like giving a dysfunctional dog food for treat, right, to to bribe the dog to comply or, or to hope that the dog complies with the food to shock color dog. So you create oppressive force on them. You know, if you've ever had a shock collar held it in your hand, it freaking hurts. And dogs are hypersensitive to touch. You go touch a dog when he's sleeping, you see the skin flick, right? You see the skin flick right away or and flinch, right? Immediately. A shock collar. You can imagine how that feels to a dog. It's a, it's a, it's a unskilled individual professional um, that has to use a shock collar. Really is. It really, really is. If you're that good, you don't need a shock collar. If you're that good, you don't need a slip collar. If you're that good, you don't need medication. If you're that good, you don't need to use treats or food as a professional. You don't need it. I've never used treats or, or food. No shock collar. Nothing. And that's with predators. That's with giants. It just sickens me, uh, as you can tell, because the shot caller thing, only the weak use that. Only the weak professional needs to use that. If you're having to use that, you're going to need to change the way you work with dogs and people's dogs. It's like walking around getting stung by a bee. And then you're walking around five more minutes later and you get stung by another bee and another bee. And you're like, what the heck? I didn't, what, where's these bees coming from? And then you change direction. You get stung by a bee again. And then you, what, what? That's, that's what the shock collar is. And it hurts like freaking crazy. And it causes fear in your dog. That's why. That's why they're compliant because they're afraid. Is that the way to train a dog? Fear? Okay, so she goes on uh, on the other uh, one one the other day spoke with us for two hours from Michigan. He said Floki, our twenty month old uh, Weem, has resource guarding issues. Well, duh. Oh gosh. Yeah, of course. But why does he have resource guarding issues? Right. Without photos, I can't give Sherry too much of an explanation. But at the end of the day, these issues and him going for the face and all stuff, these are aspects of low self esteem. That's it. And then how do we extrapolate that low self-esteem into other aspects of the personality dysfunction? Super simple. Right? Makes sense. Low self-esteem. It's not lack of self-confidence. It's not lack of self-worth. It's not codependency. It's not interdependency. It's not resource guarding as per se. It's low self-esteem. And how do you address it? It's really simple. To me, it's super simple. That's why I read this whole thing in the beginning. I already, I don't have to. I don't even have to read these things through because I already know what the answers are by just the way the person writes. When people and I always tell people write detailed descriptions, and I read it off, and I see the personality of their dog in their photos, just like you can look at a picture of somebody that you know, and you can see the laugh lines and the smiles and the worries and the mischievousness in their face. I do that with dogs. 
It takes me less than one minute to do so. Like I said, go to rfrfarkbark.com. Look under help for your dog. Look under testimonials. You will see screenshots of public posts online in my Facebook group where I'm evaluating people's dogs on their descriptions and on their photos with accuracy that they can't even believe. And I think Brandy Bourne, uh, you're one of them who has followed me uh, from day one. Same Sammy as well. All these people, you, you've seen the work of Mark, uh, Debbie, uh, who's uh, little Sammy's auntie. Uh, you've all seen what I've done. It, it, it's nothing. And, and Sammy says, I have to get them to trust. A shock collar won't do that. Exactly. You know, if, if like I said before, you go away on a, uh, on, a, on a mini vacation, a work trip. You come home to your partner, and you're so happy to see them. And you're like, oh, my gosh, right? You're so happy, and you, you go up to give them a hug, and then they just walk away from you, or they shove you out of the way. What are you going to think? And be like, I thought, I, I, what? Right? And they keep doing that to you every time? I thought, what? I thought you loved me. What? And then it affects what? Low self-esteem, right? affects their self-esteem and with this particular dog Floki it's his low self-esteem that's happening and him attacking a care aid worker uh, in the previous home then points to the fact that the household uh, obviously was older that's a guess on my end but that behavior of him attacking the care aid worker as I said in the top of this is not the first time I don't suspect it's the first time these behaviors are not inherent. These behaviors are learned. These behaviors are done because more than anything else of an isolation type of t home that Floki previously was in, which is why I say you should get him out, Sherry. You should take him out for walks, get him out there, uh, get him in the neighborhood. He does not have to meet other dogs. He does not have to meet other people. You just need to get him outside to begin with and then go from there. So the resource guarding, the resource guarding is ancillary. So it's not the primary dysfunction. It's ancillary to the primary dysfunction of low self-esteem. So these are coping mechanisms. Does it make sense to you all out there? Yes, it does. I'm mean, just going to assume it makes sense to you all because it makes sense to me. And obviously, I have a 100% success rate. So... Just a, uh, this is the silly stuff that I'm reading here, uh, here from other, not, not, not from Sherry, but from these other people. Um, so the guy provided, uh, the trainer provided a good website, drsofiayin.com, and recommended in-home training from APDT, <laughs> Association of Professional Dog Trainers, which relies on Dr. Ian Dunbar's bite level scale, which is rhetorical because they're evaluating dogs after they've attacked. You want to be able to evaluate it evaluate a dog before they attack again and um my scale vid dog uh vid this uh, vid uh, dysfunction scale um explains where my scale is and it it completely destroys uh this apdt scale as well as dr ian dunbar's scale it, it makes his scale look like it's a crayon coloring book uh because of his um uh immature and incorrect uh, uh familiarity with dangerous dogs i mean just because you just because you work with dangerous dogs doesn't mean you can help dangerous dogs, especially if you can't help every dangerous dog. If you cannot help, if you're a professional dog trainer and you cannot help every single dog and you're using a shock collar and you're doing all these things and you're blaming the dog, then you need to find a better way to work with dogs. Because that's none of that is necessary, guys. None of this. I've, I've heard of Dr. Sophia Yin. I know she died a few years ago, I think, from cancer. So it, it is a tragedy. I did see some of her stuff, and I don't want to say ill of the dead, but I will just say that her stuff is incorrect. It, 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 is, it is, again, grasping. It's incorrect. And, um, um, you know, Anyways, uh, yeah, so APDT is just, is just silly. I mean, why, why would you want to hire somebody from a, an accreditation facility, uh, Association of Professional Dog Trainers, APDT? Why would you want to hire somebody from a, a profession, a, a, an association that has a 40% failure rate, if not higher? That's their success. 
They're only succeeding with about 60% of the dogs at most. Why would you want to hire from a team where they're failing at, at 40% failure rate? It's ridiculous. <laughs> like you would, you know, and I'm being serious. I'm really laughing at this. You would actually hire somebody that's a failure to work with your dangerous dog. It doesn't make sense. And what is the failing aspect of working with your dangerous dog is going to say to you, I can't help your dog. And then you'll be like, oh, really? Oh, my gosh. It's a, it's a money grab. Like I said, uh, you know, even the local BCSPCA here, they have their animal kind, which I think is a plagiaristic ripoff from uh, Ellen DeGeneres' Be Kind program. Nice way to kind of rip off uh, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, their SPCA, that made uh, $39.1 million in uh, 2018 in donations. You know, they have their dog trainer certification program <laughs> and all that stuff, which is like you're certifying people who are already certified from the APDT and other accreditation professions. So you're recertifying for what? Oh, the money. I forgot. You have to pay fees to be certified by the BCSBC Animal Kind Program. And the BCSBCA killed a puppy that they couldn't handle in North Vancouver that bit the owner's uh, pant leg. And they killed a puppy named Echo. And then when you go to Google, uh, North Vancouver BCSBCA kills puppy, you'll find that on the second page because your $39.1 million of donations to the SPCA has gone to pay for AdWords to what? To buy out the negative press. That's the organization that you donate to, the SPCA. You're donating millions of dollars to the SPCA so they can run a publicity campaign. That's where the monsters in big charity lay. It's all about the money for these guys. Where's the backyard breeder uh, 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 legislation that was supposed to happen back um, in 2014? Um, okay, so anyway, so uh, he, she says, um, in-home training with the APDD, all right? Uh, but the two local ones, one is busy and the other one hasn't returned my call. I understand since it's a holiday week craze, I would be grateful if you would be able to occasionally help us out, okay? And thanks, and again. And th this stuff is really simple, uh, Sherry. Uh, you know, and I'm saying this because I'm going to send you the link to this afterwards. But th like I said, this stuff is super duper simple. The 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 reactions that are happening um, with, with Floki is low self-esteem. So he's going to have these behaviors because he doesn't trust you. And because he's led such a sheltered life, he doesn't know how to have a an emotional maturity. He hasn't gone through the process. He has not learned how to be social. He's been babied too much. So that's all contributing low self-esteem. And how do you address it, Sherry? Really straightforward. I'll send you the link and we can talk about it and all that stuff. Um, it's easy. Uh, you know, to have to phone so many trainers and still be nowhere shows you what the industry is like. You got a 40% failure rate. Now you know why people don't return calls, why trainers don't return calls. Why they do it? Like, I mean, there's a rescue here in Vancouver called Love That Last Dog Rescue. They go to a treat trainer. They, the, they're the ones that I have in my video, Diesel, the Great Pyrenees. And in that video, Diesel's off the 120 plus pound dog, semi feral, lived in a barn his entire life protecting livestock, limited association association with humans. Almost no association with other dogs. Took his foster almost three weeks to be able to feed him without him trying to attack her in her backyard. She, she had to leave him in the backyard for a couple of weeks because she couldn't trust him again inside. He was, he's, you see in the video, he's super, he's super dangerous. And she forgot his muzzle. And I'm like, okay, well, right, you can see that. He, she was supposed to bring his muzzle. She was so nervous she forgot his muzzle. 
Um, love that last brought him down to me uh, in Port Moody and all that stuff. And she's like, I, I, I forgot the muzzle. I'm like, okay, well, as long as you can hold on to him. And she's only 105 pounds and diesel is 120 pounds. Uh, and I'm like, just hold on to him. As long as you can hold on to him, I'm cool. You can see the video, what I've done. And you can see me reading the dogs at two tenths of a second. Those are the dangerous dogs. Those, those are the dogs that are easy for me. They're straightforward. And they're easy for, for her as foster, Sue, because she was able to do it herself. And you see there's a, there, on my YouTube channel, there's four videos with Diesel. On the fourth uh, video, 21 days in, and I think that was uh, one, two, three, fourth. It was a fourth session, 21 days later. I'm walking him. He's not trying to attack me. I'm literally walking him and petting him. No treats, no medication, nothing at all. So this is all easy to do. It just, you want to hire somebody who is going to have 100% success rate or even 80%. 80% better than 60%. Go talk to any trainer of behaviors and ask them what their success rate is. And better than anything else, send them a note and saying, you know, my dog is 110 pounds and my dog has attacked people and I can't muzzle him <laughs> um, because he'll get the muzzle off, et cetera. And just say, yeah, I can't trust him and he, he does this and that and just make up some plausible storyline and send that to a trainer see how many will actually respond to you probably maybe 30 percent will respond back to you and they will say well you know what uh, i don't think you'll be able to work with this dog or i won't be able to work with this dog and you may sit, may want to see about medication or killing your dog because they don't know what to do i get people who who, who always say to me now I know this dog is not as as dangerous as the dogs you deal with. I'm like, well, it doesn't matter if it's not as dangerous as the dog as I deal with because to you, to you and your dog, your dog and you, it is a very important issue to address. And that's the reason why you're, con you're contacting me because you feel that it is 100% important to you. So to you and to me, your dog is just as important as the most dangerous dog in, in North America. It doesn't matter. I won't turn you down. If it's a mild dog, I won't. Uh, definitely, it's it, then I give you a great idea of what happens psychologically. But if it's a dangerous dog, a predatorial dog, my answer is yes. Bring your dog to me. My videos prove it. Newspaper articles, it all proves it. I don't have to embellish. I just want to change this industry so that they realize these egos that they rest upon are the emperor's new clothes. All this can change, all this can happen, and we are going to, over time, my faithful followers and fans and, and friends, we are going to change this and help save some of those six million dogs that are killed annually. You and me, we are going to do this. We can change the world, and it's going to happen. And then eventually, eventually we're going to change the world for all the dogs. Maybe not in my lifetime, but I'm leaving this digital legacy for everyone to, to do so. Um, so uh, I am hoping next week that I will have out my first podcast. And I've been working on it. And I apologize for not doing broadcasts for the last couple of days, uh, Monday and Wednesday. Um, it was dealing with stuff like that. And, and yesterday as well, I, didn't, I haven't been posting or anything like that. But, um, you know, um, you'll see. So next week I'll put out my first bot, uh, podcast. And um, it's going to be um, about treat training and conversation. And uh, I will uh, I'll be doing it in this room. And then eventually we'll be seeing people here. I'll be seeing people uh here um, to interview uh, who have dogs and talk about their dogs in different formats and what dogs mean to each other. Uh, and uh, if you know anybody, let me know as well. They're more than welcome to join here.
thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a great week. Welcome to December 2019. It's actually my birthday this month. So uh, it's a it's a big thing. I'm actually going to be working with one of, uh, with the dog on 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 my birthday um, later on this month. But uh, yeah, anyhow, it's kind of a nice way to go forward. All right, thank you, everyone. Be kind to each other. Truly, be kind. Not the animal kind plagiarism, but the actual be kind to other people. To have some generosity of your soul for somebody else. To give them an extra 12, 15, 20 seconds when you normally wouldn't give them any time at all to talk about something that they can't get over. Once they start talking about it, then you can get over it. And you can say to them, okay, we've talked about it a little bit longer than normal. Um, I would love to be able to talk about something else so that we can move on and you can get over your pity party and you can get through with your life and, and let things go on a bit better. Um, and that is Anthony on the other side of this, if you can hear him. Thank you so much, and we will talk at another time. Bye-bye.